Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Vicky, can you help me and can you um, can you show you the, my presentation? I'm in it, yes, just a second, please, because I also need to open it. Because I'm not a problem. Work. Yeah, don't worry, oh. it will be fine. Just need to open it as well. Might take a second. Meanwhile, I would like to encourage the audience to send your, your questions to all the, the presenters and any questions you have uh, concerning the social and economic impact of the uh, pandemic, we are happy to, to take them. So uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, my question is uh, today, do Germany's COVID measures violate the constitution? So now please uh, screen two. Yes, just a second. It uh, seems to be pro okay now it, it's fine. So that's uh, the overview um, on the structure of my talk. I will um, start with the legal framework and then I will continue with two current constitutional law issues um, and in the end I will summarize. So please uh, let's move on to screen two. I start with the constitutional framework. The German basic law contains a number of provisions that apply to existential situations of crisis. They make up what I call Germany's emergency constitution. In contrast to the constitution of the Weimar Republic and its now infamous Article 48, which handed broad powers to the president in states of emergency, the basic law does not contain a general provision covering all emergencies. When introducing the amendments on the state of emergency in 1968, the constitutional legislator instead opted for a model that regulated the various state of emergencies and their respective regimes with great specificity. Chiefly, the basic law provides for the classical emergencies, and that is civil unrest and war, and for natural catastrophes. Most notably, and in contrast to Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution and many other constitutions, the basic law rules out any suspension of constitutional rights during emergencies. What follows from this for the current COVID-19 pandemic? First, there is no health emergency in the constitution that could be relied upon in the current crisis. As there is no residual general provision, the current crisis has to be dealt with through the ordinary provisions of the constitution. The extensive restrictions of constitutional rights that were introduced in Germany during the COVID-19 pandemic have to be tested against the catalog of constitutional rights within articles one to 19 of the basic law. As none of the provisions of the constitution of emergency apply to the COVID-19 pandemic, the central instrument for fighting the crisis is a statute, or as Professor Hoffmann said, a simple act, and that is the Federal Protection Against Infections Act, which was amended on March 27, 2020 to accommodate the current situation. What was particularly adapted was the Act's paragraph five. Its new section one introduced at the level of statutory law, at the level of simple act, a new state of emergency into German law, the epidemic emergency of national concern, a term closely mirroring WHO law. On March 25, the Bundestag declared such an epidemic emergency and has not yet lifted it. The most important legal consequence of its declaration lies in the fact that the Federal Ministry of Health is now allowed to is issue executive rules in the health area. Even before these changes, paragraphs 28 and 32 of the Act delegated to the lender the power to issue executive rules to combat the pandemic. <laughs> 
starting March 2020, the lender have used these powers extensively. And so you might ask why the lender and the reason for that is that in Germany as a federal system, it's the lender that exercise the federal laws. So every land has not only issued so-called COVID regulations, but has also amended and updated these regulations repeatedly, adapting them to the changing situation. The first measure these rules introduced was the so-called lockdown. This included curfews, social distancing rules, bans on social events and demonstrations as well as shutting down businesses, schools and daycares. The executive rules also served as a vehicle for the subsequent easing of these restrictions. This included rules under what conditions business could reopen, as well as ordering the wearing of masks in shops and on public transport. Wonderful. So um, I now turn to the two current constitutional law issues. First, the measures that have certainly demanded most of the general public were the massive restrictions on fundamental rights. They affected and partially still affect a considerable number of constitutional rights. This includes notably the right to move freely, restricted by quarantines the right to free religious exercise restricted by the temporary ban on all religious service, the right to academic freedom restricted by the ban on classroom instruction at universities, the freedom of movement restricted for instance by the ban to travel to weekend homes, the right to a profession affected by the shutting down of stores and restaurants, and not least the right to assemble freely. That raises the question whether or not all of these restrictions are in line with the basic law. As mentioned, as it does not allow the suspension of constitutional rights, the basic law instead follows a, as I call it, one size fits all model. That is, its constitutional rights, protections apply both in normal times and in times of emergency. At the same time, however, all rights protections contained in the basic law can generally be limited, with the notable exception of the right of to human dignity, as long as the measures that limit them do not violate the proportionality principle, nor a number of other protections. For example, the so-called irremovable essence or human dignity core of the respective rights. These protections are what I call the negative constitutional law on emergencies because they set final limits to the state power, to the state's power, especially in times of crisis. The proportionality principle holds a central position in German constitutional law. It states that a constitutional right can only be restricted if the restriction pursues a legitimate aim, is suitable and is necessary to further that aim, and is not, in its means, disproportionate to the aim pursued. Again, um, against this backdrop, it comes as no surprise that during the pandemic, the at times very far-reaching restrictions gave rise to the question of their proportionality. For many, particularly for small business, the shutdown will mean bankruptcy. This makes the question whether these measures were and still are proportionate all the more urgent. And indeed, the courts reviewed the proportionality of the COVID measures even during the state of emergency. So there are let's say about at least 500 um, decisions by the administrative higher courts. In a few eye-catching decisions, they declared some of the measures disproportionate. However, most cases in which the plaintiffs raised the issue of disproportionality remained unsuccessful. For what reason? 
The main reason for the lack of success is that the proportionality principle remains a weak standard in existential situations of crises. When the good that the measures are meant to protect is of such overarching importance as hundreds of thousands of lives, most state measures will turn out to be proportionate. The second reason why the proportionality principle is difficult to operationalize in times of emergency is the lack of knowledge that usually comes with them. When reviewing the suitability and necessity of a measure, such, such as temporarily closing down a daycare center, courts do not have more information at their disposal than the ex executive issuing the rule. They both have to re rely on the same source, um, sources at any given time, typically the scientific reviews and summaries published by the federal Robert Koch Institute. So I'm, I'm uh, still under point one, second bullet point, the weakness of the pro proportionality principle. To stay with the example, which role children play in the transmission of the disease remains unclear to this day. As a consequence, all the court can do when reviewing the suitability and necessity of a measure is refer to the executive's prerogative. For this reason, other standards of control become more important, such as the equality clause that indeed played a major role in many decisions. I now turn to the freedom of assembly. In what follows, I want to focus on the freedom of assembly, a right that was intensely restricted. Most COVID regulations the lender issued contained explicit or implicit bans on all demonstrations. As a consequence, most authorities forbade any planned demonstration. The reason why these restrictions were so problematic was because they essentially lifted the right to assembly altogether during the time they were in force, which was mostly during the months of March and April. Factually, the freedom of assembly was suspended, which is something the basic law does not allow. For these reasons, one should welcome that the Federal Constitutional Court, in an injunction, interpreted a COVID regulation from Hessen in a way that turned the tide on how the freedom of assembly was addressed in the courts. The Karlsruhe Court refused to read a blanket ban on all assemblies into the Hessen regulation. The city Gießen, where the case had arisen, subsequently had to revisit the question where, whether an assembly of 30 participants could not take place. Indeed, it allowed the assembly to take place under very strict safety requirements. The second highly contested question that I want to address in the, is the newly amended paragraph 5 of the Infection Protection Act. So I come now to number two. A central problem of the provision lies in the fact that once an epidemic emergency of national concern is declared, its section two gives to the federal minister of health the power to issue regulations or dec decrees that may deviate from a number of federal statutes in the health area. Scholars of constitutional law have described this new paragraph as opening the constitutional floodgates. The reason for such a sensitive reaction is partly historic. In the Weimar Republic, the president's practice of issuing emergency regulations played a hugely important role. One consequence of the practice was that at the end of the Weimar Re Republic, the Reichstag, the parliament, had basically ceased to pass laws. The founding fathers and mothers of the basic law drew important lessons from this. For one, the basic law explicitly rules out emergency regulations. For another, its Article 80 limits the power to issue executive rules in important respects, specifically to protect the primacy of statutory law. A number of voices among constitutional law scholars were reminded by paragraph 5 of the Infections Protections Act of the practice surrounding Article 48. 
in the very first real state of emergency of the Federal Republic, the Bundestag was repaired, they felt, to abandon its legislative responsibility. The legislature, they claim, did not only leave important lawmaking functions to the Federal Minister of Health through that delegation, but also, and that touches the core of the problem, granted him the power to decree exceptions from statutory law. Mm, what should we make of these arguments? I want to plead for a modifying sober line. Paragraph 5 of the Infection Protection Act does indeed raise constitutional doubts. There are convincing reasons that the new provision is un unconstitutional due to the manner in which it allows executive rules to change statutory law. Such regulations may be constitutional in exceptional cases, but paragraph 5 seems to overstep these exceptions when it names the statutes from which the executive can deviate only when very generally. And not least, the provision raises federalism issues. But notwithstanding the fact that the provision is unconstitutional, the accusation that it opens the floodgates overshoots the mark by far. To be sure, there are countries, and, and we have heard that from, from Professor Hoffman, where the delegation of broad powers to the executive during the COVID crisis raises serious rule of law concerns. But paragraph five is no such case. It takes very careful constitutional analysis to assess whether the provision is unconstitutional or not. All the more so as the legislature included a sunset clause according to which the delegation loses its force on April 1st, 2021. The question whether the provision is unconstitutional is thus an ordinary question of constitutional law, one which will at some point be settled by the federal constitutional court. Opening floodgates is quite a different matter. Finally, comparing the provision to Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution is absurd. I come to my summary. So far, both the federal level, level and the lender have fared comparatively well with the strategies they have pursued during the COVID crisis. The measures taken do, however, times strain the limits of what is constitutionally permissible. And still, the rule of law is functioning as it should. The sheer number of over 500 published administrative and constitutional court decisions on pandemic measures attests to that. What remains open, however, are the economic consequences. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kaiser, for, uh, for your very interesting presentation. I immediately uh, give the floor 